All right. Welcome, everybody, to Keycode Media Burbank. Really appreciate you all being here. This is not um, an editor's lounge. It's actually a, a Keycode Media-driven event that we're doing tonight um, with our great partner, Avid. And we have the, the honor of having Michael Krulik, who will really be going into the Media Composer and talking about it. Really excited about it. Michael knows the product. Um, a, a couple things for those of you after the event. Um, we've been having an actual hands-on environment with Media Composer 2019 with our head of education, Jonathan Amayo. And we recently just got approved for um, ETP funding um, for our classrooms for AVID Media Composer classes, Nexus, ACSR, um, Premier, and Resolve that we'll have here and be part of the um, ETP program for that, and that's part of what we do in our classroom is teach people hands-on and also go on site. Um, a little bit of a commercial about us. Um, we've been growing. We now have eight offices across the U.S. We're in Denver, Dallas, and well, just recently um, Advanced Broadcast Solutions in Seattle has joined us. So end-to-end -end from education to integration to 7x24 AVID aftermarket support. Um, we have by far the most AVID ACSRs in the world, um, maybe even more than AVID. And so we're pretty committed to the product. I know you guys are really committed and interested in hearing what AVID is talking about tonight. So we basically have three aspects of the agenda, which I think you'll find all three of them compelling. The first one is Michael really going through the interface. You know, what's with 2019? You know, why did AVID go this direction? What are cool things that are compelling around it? And we're actively working with Avid. I, I saw this interface 18 months ago. I'm talking with designers and product managers and their concept about, you know, what are we going to do with the media composer? It's 1990s when Tom O'Haney and Michael Phillips, you know, created the design. And it worked really well, especially for people who understood the paradigm of AB editorial from tape to tape. And that's really what Avid mirrored at that time. But now if you talk to anyone about tape, especially if they're under 32 years old, they won't know what tape is, or that it's a legacy from a past days of, of gone, and they work different. And so what Avid really looked at doing was taking the interface and the stability of the system that delivers the top television and feature films you know, to the world under very heavy deadlines, yet at the same time, taking the latest technology, and their designers did things like, you know, they studied, you know, how kids work on Instagram and how they just interact with the media. And so really, from a gestural level, try to really conceptualize what the next generation, you know, of a refresh of a product that a very big portion loves what it does, but they also weren't attracting the level of users to keep it fresh moving forward in the future. So that was really the objective AVID was looking at. And you know, on June 20th, all of your media composers will automatically update, I'm kidding, <laughs> with 2019. <laughs> so thank you for coming. You know, I still believe, although we are streaming this on both YouTube and Facebook, and it'll be up for later viewing for people that want to view it. I also believe that, you know, especially with Hollywood, collaboration and engaging people face to face, there is a benefit to that on a creative level, a networking level, and just an expansion of your, of your circle. So we like to do these events on occasion. So thank you for being part of it. And let's take it off from Michael Krulik right now. Take it away. Thank you. Great, well thank you for joining us and hi to mom and dad who hopefully are watching the stream. Um, this is what I do. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I think, uh, has anyone seen 2019 yet? If, if I, know, I know you have. Several of you, you may have, I saw a whole bunch of people in the, uh, the try, try It room, so definitely get your hands on it over there, come over to the pod uh, as well. But um, can you all see that pretty well? I, I can't tell, I have these lights in my eyes. Um, so basically, you may look at this and go, oh, it looks like, Media Composer, right? Who's currently using Media Composer? Who has never used Media Composer before? It's okay, don't be shy. Uh, what I wanted to uh, explain is there, there is a reason why we did this. You know, Mike mentioned that you know, in the uh, 1990s, 
uh, is when Media Composer started. This is 30 years of you know, development and technology, hundreds of thousands of users around the world that you know, when, when they see this UI or they see changes, they're gonna be like, we hate change. You know, <laughs> don't change what we do. So the idea is we didn't want to do that. We wanted to create something that's refreshed. We've reimagined the UI, so there is some change there, but it's more uh, in visual representation, not functionality, because you still have all of your keys you can customize, your menus, uh, but we took a lot of feedback from our editors. Because, of course, 30 years of development or 30 years of technology, there are some pain points that people had. So we want to uh, have a nice balance between what current editors can do, but we also want to create something new for the people who've never seen Media Composer before to be able to look at this and go, oh, that makes sense, that's intuitive. There's stuff that's not hidden that I can go in and take a look at. So I'll go ahead and dive into a lot of this and uh, point out some interesting things. The first thing is, uh, when you're working in Media Composer, whether you're on a Mac or PC, you have bins and windows that are on top of one another. And editors said, we don't like that. So what you'll first see is you have a paneled UI. Ooh. <laughs> it's the little things. So you can actually lock your windows, your timeline, your composer window, your bins, into a single, now I'm only on a single monitor. If you do have two monitors, most edit bays have a bin monitor and an edit monitor. If you attach a second monitor on there, your canvas will actually extend across both uh, monitors and you'll be able to customize and lock your panels uh, across two displays or three displays, whatever you have. But we also don't want to limit people because there are people that don't mind their bins and windows on top of one another. So I can actually grab this bin and pull it out and this bin can be floating. So you can float your bins and windows if you want, or you can take that and drop it back into your bin. So this is just a simple layout. Your bin, your bin container, a new term here, a bin container is in the upper left at the uh, default. Your source and record are right here, so your source and record window and your timeline. But if you look at the far right, I'll zoom in, these are your workspaces. So you now have instant access to go into your edit, color, effects, or audio workspace just by a simple click. And the windows will change depending on what you're selecting and going into. Because every Media Composer editor knows if you want to go into your different display, you have to go windows, workspaces, and pull it down here, or map it to a key. So for somebody who's never seen Media Composer before, you now have instant access to your workspaces right here. But the seasoned Media Composer editor might say, that's real estate. That's some part of the window that I don't want to give up. So if I right click, you'll see that I can change it to a simple icon or I could even hide that workspace area. But now if I go to the upper right, I can pull down and open up my workspaces right there. So close the workspace, open the workspace, it's up to you. Show workspace bar and it brings back what I have right there. And if you customize your workspaces and save them, you'll start populating the extra region down here with all of your new workspaces. So you can create them, again you can map them to your keys if you want, and you can put them down the left side, or the right side of your display, of your uh, layout. Great. Uh, so, other things, I, I mentioned the bin container. Now the bin container contains your bins, obviously, but what you may notice, again, the seasoned Media Composer editor, where's my project? I want my project. Well, the editor said, if you had a project window up and you're going around and you're closing bins, how many times did you close your project? Never, <laughs> I don't believe you. So sometimes you do, now it's not you know, do or die, it's not gonna kill you, but it's disruptive, right? You close the project, things shut down, or it says, do you want to save, and you go back in. So what we did is we hid the project window. You can bring it up if you want, but the idea is basically your project window, once you get into your project, are your bins, right? So if I go to the left side of my bin container and open it up, I have my list of bins. I can close that. Again, it's all a matter of real estate, or open that up. So that's the bin container, and you may notice 
The icon for bins have changed. For the over, I mean, for 30 years, it was the two strips of film hanging above a bin. How many new editors out there know two strips of film hanging over a bin? What's that, right? So we changed it a little bit so you can actually see when a bin is opened and when it's closed. So again, a little more designed for new people, but also with the old film strip above the bin, it was just a light or dark. So you really may not know when it's open, you just know it visually because the bin is open. So your bins are right there, your bin container. And my bin container, again, I talked about having two monitors. So if I pull the bin container out and float that, watch what happens as the source and record windows fill up my layout. Again, no windows are on top of one another. You're not gonna accidentally select your finder, your background level, and go into your different display. Only if you want to. But imagine you have your bin and your edit monitor, and your bin monitor has your bin going across your entire display right here. And if I open up my list of bins, every time I double click, it's gonna open up the bins in a different tab. So here are your tabs across the top. And you may think, okay, that, that's okay, but I wanna customize that. I can either float my bins, or as I start pulling bins out, rather than floating, do you see the little green bars on the top, bottom, left, and right? They're the drop zone. So you can choose where you wanna drop that. So I'm gonna take that bin, that first one, sequences, and I'm gonna drop it in the bottom, and that light area is showing me the region where that's gonna be dropped. So now, in that bin container, I have a split between those bins. Let's take another one. Let's take cuts, we'll drop that in the middle. We'll take music, and I actually wanna split that to the right. So I have now a cool new layout to my bins that are top, bottom, left, right. And by the way, this can also be scripts. So if you're working with scripting or script sync, your scripts can also be inside of these panels as well. You can do different fonts, different colors. If I right click, there is set your background color. You can change that. Uh, your font is just simply going to Windows, setting your font, and choosing the font size and style you want there. So again, total customization. You'll also see that you do have, because I am working off of Nexus, which is in the machine room, your bin locks are also there. Yes? Can you still create folders? You still can create folders. So if you right click, new folder, create your folder, and then drop stuff inside of that as well. Correct, the question was, can you click on one and float it? What you would do, you could do a couple of things. If you open it up, you do have to pull it out to float it. Uh, there is an option under Windows to float all panels, so all of a sudden you wanna float everything, you can do that, and I believe we're working on an option to actually say float specific bins, so. so Correct, exactly. So that would be familiar behavior if you float all of your panes, your panels where you can now go in and have your source record your timeline and your bins all floating at the same time. And you, then you can go in and lock them. Can you do that by shift dinosaur? <laughs> shift dinosaur? Uh, I don't know about that. Um, but uh, there, there are different options. Uh, there was a question in the back as well. Oh, great. Uh, can you create a folder within a folder? Let's see, I haven't tried that. So if I open up a folder, and let me move, um, let's take a bin, and we'll put that in there. Uh, if I click on the bin, on the folder, and I say create a new bin, it will do it actually inside of the folder. If I go and say, yeah, there's no new folder inside of that. So it looks like there's no folders inside, but you can say select and create bins inside. So if you create a new folder, can you throw it into that folder? Let's try that. New folder. Take that, we'll drop it right there, and there's your new folder inside. So it's not creating it inside, but you can organize all of your bins and folders the way you want. All right? Um, an interesting thing with the bins, by the way, good, great questions. The bin, you'll notice that the text, frame, and script view uh, options are now moved to the top of the bin. That was a feature request, because editors said naturally their eyes went to the top of things, so we moved it on top. But you'll also notice, if I go in and start changing the size of this bin, watch what happens to the icons as they now collapse into a single button. 
interesting. I mean, it's the little things again, because what normally happened is you'd close your bin, and if you wanted to go to a different view, you'd have to open up the bin again to select your option. So consolidating into the different view, being able to change your different views uh, visually here as well uh, for, your, for your bin. All right, let me go ahead and close this. I'm gonna take my bin container, again, containing all of my bins, and I wanna lock it back into my layout. So I'm gonna grab the vertical title bar, you can see that rather than having the name of the window on top, just to make it a little different, we now have it vertical on the left side. Again, it's a real estate issue. Uh, but I wanna now take this bin container and notice when I start dragging it out, I now have all those little green drop zones where I can decide where I wanna lock in my bin container. So I'll put it back to the left side of my source record and there it's now locked back into my view. Let's go ahead and close uh, some of these bins here. Um, I have two bins, I have my clips and I have my rough sequences here. So again, you have your different views for your uh, bin uh, layout. You have your text view, you have your frame view, and you have your script view. Notice also, there now is a slider. So if you wanna change the size of your frame, you now have a little slider because everybody knows in Media Composer, how do you change the size? Control L, Command L, or how do you make it small? K for small. So, that's a, that's a joke, I won't take credit. Derek, who I used to work with, uh, says L for large, K for small. So, um, Command K, so now you have a little slider. And the reason, because everybody now knows if you're in photos or documents or anything, you have a slider to change the size. Again, trying to make it more intuitive for new editors. Now a really cool feature here. Right now if we take a look at the bin here in frame view, you'll see I have you know, clips all over the place. So wouldn't it be nice to have a little window which is showing me all of my clips that I have in there? I don't know what I have in there, but visually I wanna have a nice preview. So if I right click in my bin and turn on uh, show bin map, watch what happens. It's gonna bring up a little landscape view of my bin. So that is the size of my bin and that white outline is the region that I'm seeing in my bin. So I can say, oh wait, there's clips down here, or there's clips over here. So now I have just like a video game or Google Maps or just a nice landscape that I can now take a look at all of the clips that I have in there. Kind of cool, kind of different. But again, you can turn that on or off by your, uh, your bin map. All right, so another interesting thing as far as design went, because a lot of people do have a bin monitor and an edit monitor, uh, the reason why you can open and close the list of your bins in the bin container is if I go under file and say create a new bin container, it defaults to a floating bin container that, let's say that's on a different monitor, so we'll put it over here. So as I go and start opening up bins, I don't have to go all the way over to the project window to open up a new bin. I can open or close that list of bins no matter where the bin container across the two monitors may lie. So again, it's just a matter of do I want to have to keep reaching across or do I want to make it more convenient? Just again, it's the little things. That's, yes? That's a duplicate of the original. Actually, it's only a bin container, so I'm not duplicating the actual bin. I can't. It, it's the same list, but I can't have the same bins open. I can't have two of the same bins open in different bin containers. I can move one to the other, but I can't have a bin, the same bin open in two different containers, okay? Another thing is I can take multiple tools, multiple windows, and I can tab them. So if I take this bin container and drop it over here, rather than dropping it into a drop zone, if I hold down a modifier, I can drop it in as a tab in my window here. So this could be the effect palette, this could be audio tools, this can be other things that you can drop into your window as tabbed items. Just get a nice uh, different way to go in and create your layouts. Now uh, who's familiar with the smart tool? The smart tool, the left side of your timeline, when it first came out, people screamed and hollered, it was the worst thing in the world. And I was told that it would never go away. Well, guess what? It's not there anymore. It's hidden. 
The smart tool is still there. It's still a function, but we're not taking up the real estate on the left side of your timeline, which is also interesting because editors were saying sometimes they'd go in to change tracks and they'd inadvertently you know, turn on or off a smart tool. So we've moved it to buttons that can be mapped. You'll see them on the top, your segment and your trim modes, even your transition manipulation, which were smart tools are mappable to a key or two buttons, and if you right click, you can turn on or off which one you want to have active, same thing with trim mode, or if you hold down option and just click, it cycles you through your tools. Or again, they can be mapped to a key. I believe they default off. But also you do want to, and this is not something in the new software, but a lot of people say, how do I make it work like Media Composer uh, traditionally does. If you go to your timeline settings, you wanna make sure you go to your edit and turn on clicking the time code track or ruler disables your smart tools. I think by default that's off. And only one segment tool at a time can be enabled. That's on by default, so turn those on. Okay, that's under timeline settings. That's in the current version, not just the new one. I mean, even years ago. Yes? So what's that one to do again? You were leading right into my next feature. Now, the dude, the dude, the weightlifter. Does everyone know what the weightlifter does? Lifts. Lifts your edit. So the weightlifter was in the original design of Media Composer, and it went away like maybe 10 or 12 years ago. People were like, I didn't know it went away but we brought them back in this version because it's sort of iconic to Media Composer, the lift man. The weightlifter and the scissors. I know it's, it's you know funny people actually applauded when we showed it. The weightlifter, if anybody you know used or remembers Lightworks, had the shark, I think, to delete things or grab things. This is our shark. This is our weightlifter. Everyone knows lift man. So the lift man is back. So if you choose an edit, hit lift, it'll just lift that edit right out of your timeline. All right? Which one? The bin icon was also iconic. The new icon for bins is a drawer. So the drawer is closed or open. Like a bin. Some people call them a bins also. Your, your vegetable bin, you know, in your refrigerator. So uh, those, those have uh, changed. All right. I'm sorry, what was the question? The modifier. The modifier for your container. Uh, here, oh, to, to tab them, I'm sorry. So if I, I'm gonna do that with another tool. I'm gonna take the effect palette, which currently is not up. So if I go to the, da -da, sorry, my eyes are so bad. Effect palette, which is still command eight. If I take that, you can see it actually docked it immediately. You can see if I, if any tool comes up as a floating window, if I take that tool and start dragging it, rather than dropping it into the drop zone, if I hold down option, it's now droppable into your tab. So if you do want to stack tools on top of one another, you can tab them into your layout. Uh, yeah, you can go in and drag them into what position you want. I mean, if I take the effect palette again, and instead of it being uh, tabbed, I want to place it in between my bin container and my source record monitor. When I pull it, you'll see I can just drop it right in between. So now that could be part of that layout. Excuse me, an option to alphabetize. Uh, I think it does that automatically. Okay. Yeah, when you when you select and create your projects, even when you create your bins, little trick is you can put like little modifiers, like underscores or dashes, to help move things around or add numbers. So yeah, you can go in and uh, do that. Um, so yeah, timeline, a uh, lot of tools there. Uh, but I also want to point out, I mean, besides all of the the UI stuff, all of the different look, uh, the different feel. 
We've also added things, I think Mike mentioned some stuff, as far as deliverable. Uh, if you're trying to work in an ACES-capable workflow, so if anybody's doing any color and they need to work in ACES, oh, I know what it, this actually leads into, uh, all of your settings now, because you don't have your project window, is under File, Settings. So now, this is where you have your format, your project, your user, and your site settings. Because you don't have the project window now, how do you change your settings? This is where you can customize your keyboard and your windows and stuff as well. And if I go under format, again, if you don't know, you can now do 16K projects. No, don't groan. Um, that's actually for uh, digital signage, but it's also future-proofing for other stuff. Uh, so 16K, 2K, UK, uh, UHD, uh, UK. Um, but color spaces, RGB ACES, now comes up as an option. So we're currently working with the uh, ACES version 1.1, where you can actually go in and set up your output color space also for PQ, HLG, um, and when you start going into changing the color of your source clips, you'll see you can now choose your color adapter type to be ACES Sony, generic, Canon, Panasonic, and apply ACES capable color to your media across your entire uh, media composer. Now you're also, you'll notice, when I made that change, it gave me a solid blue whoops, icon for my display. That is full 32-bit float. So now, Media Composer is full 32-bit float capable through the entire editorial process. So for full high-end, high-res work, you can set up and work 32-bit float, fully ACES capable. Also, another thing that we added is being able to work with OP Atom and OP1A Media natively inside of Media Composer. So, yay! <laughs> All that means is different formats. I mean, Media Composer always worked OP Atom, which meant you had separate media for video and audio files. OP, I mean, MXF OP1A is now a single file. A lot of uh, companies will work uh, OP1A, and rather than having to split it up or transcode it into Avid-capable media, we can now work with more native formats. We can input, we can output MXF OP1A. And for uh, deliverable, as you're working, uh, if you do have to uh, send out DPX files for maybe a VFX house, you can go up to the highest quality and export DPX files up to 10 times faster as they were before. So when you're trying to output thousands of files that have to go to a VFX house for VFX to work and then be brought back in, you're not going to have to wait uh, as long as you did to do that. And if I go to my export option, I want to show you a new option that we have added is, duh, I just lock up? Oh, there we go. It was, it was thinking. We can output IMF. So to create IMF packages right outside of Media Composer, inside of Media Composer, to uh, companies like Netflix or other people that are requiring an MX or IMF deliverable, you can export an IMF package, which if you don't know what that is, it's actually a single folder with all of your essence, your XML data, your MXF media as one simple package that you then can hand off at high res for sending it out. Yes? They, we have been working closely with them. I think is what I can officially say. Uh, to bit flip. It's a 32-bit completely through the entire editorial process if you set it to that. Now, you, if you're working with high-res media, uh, you want to have, you know, of course, a system that can support it for playback. Uh, when you are working at high-res, 
a couple of things to point out here is if I change my under settings, under format, some people don't, hadn't seen that if you go into any high res project with Media Composer, it turns on proxy. There are some other NLEs out there that as soon as you go into a project, it actually defaults to a proxy and everyone thinks, oh, that well, plays with everything. Well, we actually default to proxy being off, so we're always trying to work with the highest resolution media inside of Media Composer. But there are times when you may not be working with the best computer to be able to work with high res. So what you can do is turn it to a proxy mode at a quarter or one sixteenth quality and what you may see with the, uh, the dog, or the dog, the frog, up in the uh, source window here, is if I change my proxy to be a quarter, it actually really didn't change the quality very much. Let's see if I go to 1 16th. Well, that's not bad either. Uh, depending on what you're doing, it will start softening the image, just so you can play back your high res media in Media Composer without having to create transcoded media. Yes? It actually, uh, uh, I didn't create those proxies. Those are generated on the fly when you turn it. It's actually changing everything, the display, uh, to a proxy resolution. Um, you're not having to create that at all. Uh, playback. So it's actually uh, changing the playback of the, the video quality. It's almost like uh, a, a, in conjunction with the display quality. Exactly. It's actually because we know that you know not everybody has the highest uh, processing power on their computer that they may have. They don't have the latest and greatest, but they need to be able to work with high-res media. So all you have to do is you can ingest, you can AMA link, you can work with high-res, and if you're finding that it's stuttering, just go into proxy and turn down to quarter or one sixteenth and see if you can play it just to edit. You're going into making your editorial changes, your decisions, you turn proxy off, and then you export whatever you've set. So again, just, just different options as far as creating it. And I'm still in ACES. Correct. The, the, the difference between the, the, the quality here and the timeline and the, the proxy is the proxy is by the project. So it will take all of the media and do it. So it's going to do it from the source or the record, not just playback in the timeline. But depending on what you're doing, it could be a combination because you could be in proxy and half yellow, half green, just to maybe get better performance. So in other words, timeline settings, the, the blue box or green, green, yellow, whatever. For display, yes. So only when you hit play that it takes into effect the, the, that's an, and the proxy, every image. Goes well, no, you, you actually probably would see if you went to change your quality here, you may notice that your display or something may change a little bit as well okay. when you're doing it. Again, it's just display. We didn't have proxy early on because people were working with SD, or they're working with HD. So as we started stepping up and having to work with these higher, uh, higher resolution formats, we needed to give everybody the tools to be able to work. So that's how we sort of, you know, engineered it. Yes? You definitely want to make sure you turn off proxy before you do an export just to, you know, be assured that you are exporting at the highest quality that you want. Now, one thing I, I do want to take a look and see, uh, because I, I literally just downloaded this latest beta build this morning. Um, I know I shouldn't have done that, but I did. Um, I just want to see in media creation. Oh, no, I think it's a uh, mix down. If I go to do a mix down now, you'll notice a new mix down. OP1A MXF mix down. So it will now create a single file mix down of your audio and video media through the menu. And some of you might be like, I don't know what that means or what you're doing, but for the people that do require a mix down just at a single file MXF OP1A, you can do that. So, really cool. Um, we're uh, just at about uh, quarter after seven. Uh, any other questions before I, you know, maybe toss in a couple tips and tricks? Yes. What are you looking at the IMO? 
Um, the little triangles on the side of the frog, does everyone know what those are? That's your mark in point. So currently, the mark in, you'll see the mark in whenever I hit an in point. That's just visually giving me, that's the end point of that. And by the way, little uh, bit of trivia, does anyone know why the mark in and out points are shaped like that? Randy knows. In the old days of film editing, when people looked at their film, they would like pull mark in and out their thumbnails. So that's why they look like that. The little thumbnails, right? <laughs> So little thumbnails on that. Um, so again, I mean, Media Composer 2019.6. Oh, yes. When will this be qualified for the new Apple cheese grater? I'm sure we are looking into that right now. Apple is not very forthcoming with all their stuff to give to us to work with. So we find out about it when you all do, for the most part, as far as Media Composer. I know I think they showed uh, Pro Tools cards inside of uh, their system, so they were uh, very eager to get on the audio side before they got onto Media Composer. I think it's a little Final Cut uh, Media Composer rivalry there. But, um, how do you think Jay-Z's gonna take over, or the Jay-Z's company? So I mean, as far as the hardware, uh, we will start working towards that. So uh, I don't think we have a date yet, but, but as soon as the announcement came out, I started getting emails, when's it gonna be qualified? So, and I went right to the developers going, when's it gonna be qualified? So uh, there, no, no word yet, but I'm, I'm sure it'll be very soon. Six of them. <laughs> Thanks. So it will, uh, yes. Could you print a title with Highlighter Plus? Can I make a title? center, like the three lines that are staring, center within the field of the object or wherever you call I have not been able to. Um, and I'm not saying it's impossible. I just could not wrap my head around it. I mess with it. I mean, uh, if anybody's seen the new titler, I mean, we introduced a titler at the end of uh, last year, along with some great multicam tools and, um, uh, some other options. So the new titler is just a tool that lets you go in and add a title to your window. Uh, very simple. Uh, your little uh, title menu here. The idea, the reason why we made a new titler, if you don't know, is the old title tool, you could never make titles higher than HD. I mean, this was again from the 90s. This was a basic title tool in creation. There was no HD. There was nothing higher than SD, you know, back then, uh, as far as editorial. So we had to make something new uh, for, uh, for Media Composer. So now you can create titles inside of uh, your timeline, inside of your editor. And I don't think at this point there is an easy way to just say lock it into uh, the center. So I don't want to sit around so and... Whenever I do it, I end up moving the whole object, the whole box, and I can never center it within the thing and ask it to visit for six months. Uh, within the frame? I, I'm saying, like, if, if you want it to go to the left, you want it to go to the right, when, when I tell it to... Talk about here? It ta yeah, it does that. It takes the whole box. It doesn't keep the text within the box. You have two lines here of varying lengths, and you want to touch up, try to justify within the box. I mean, I, I, I can try, but... I'm live, and uh, I'm, I'm, okay. I'm... I've been trying live, too, for six months. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm using New Blue Titler. That's how bad it's been. New Blue's not bad. I mean, New Blue is a really nice... Actually, I, I love Marquee as well, if people are... The Titler Plus is not bad so far in my experience. Yeah, so if you have... Well, I'm going to center those within the box. Huh? I'm going to center those within the box. Well, okay. Yeah, I think that's something you have your own center. Okay. Now this again is a version I just got today. <laughs> so maybe they fixed it, maybe they didn't. I mean, maybe it's something else that's happening there. So um, okay, cool. the best thing is to try it. Now, when this is released, if you haven't used Media Composer before, we do have the free version. 
Media Composer first, which will have this look as well. Uh, and Media Composer ranges, you know, starting at $20 a month, $10 for students, $20 a month uh, on up, depending on your options. Yes? You have a uh, Luma Keying and, you know, all of your standard keys. If you take a look at the effect palette, we have a whole series of options for keying. Luma, Matt, RGB, Spectromat, Animat, um, that can be added there. And if you need to go above anything that we do, we work with a whole series of plugins uh, that other applications use as well. Boris, um, GenArts, or actually GenArts is Boris now. Um, and so on. Uh, yeah. So uh, any other questions? Yes. Uh, that, I believe, is the plan. I don't know if you have to upgrade any sort of plug-in uh, when this goes. Or I don't know if the timing is set, but I believe the current one should work with the uh, version. Again, June 20th is the release date of Media Composer 2019.6. Yes? Uh, yes. Well, well, what do you mean, what about working with? Mm -hmm. Uh, maybe what we'll do is we'll take some of that and put it to uh, the demo product because I think we're going to get ready for the panel. But uh, I think depending on how you're working, sometimes I know it may take the background or sometimes depending on the layer, uh, you just have to be careful of how you're stacking. You may have to step into the edit in order to, to key it. But again, uh, we'd have to look at your specific example of uh, alpha channel and how you're trying to work. So, Will yes? Will the UA sound card with plugins work as well or? With UA sound card, yeah. um, I don't know if the sound cards would work inside. We have a whole series of plugins uh, that are the Pro Tools plugins that are available here. If we open up and look at you know waveforms and want to add a specific audio plugin to a track here, you'll see that the plugin comes up there as well. And these plugins again are the same plugins that Pro Tools use, and those can be added per track or per clip. 64 tracks of video, 60, 64 tracks of video. If you don't, hadn't heard, uh, at the end of the year, we did do 64 tracks of video and 64 tracks of audio. So again, some, some great stuff. Um, again, just a preview of what's come. This has been a lot of development and the development that a lot of the editors have given us to, uh, to make this. So if you haven't tried it, please try it. If you have seen Media Composer, definitely try uh, the new one. So thank you. So we said June 20th, this is coming out. Um, one of the things I don't think Michael highlighted a lot, the Avid free product, Media Composer First, will be this exact same interface, you know, limitations where you can't connect it to Nexus or share with other systems, but really trying to promote it and Beating free is really hard for really allowing students to start doing projects, posting it on YouTube, and making this something that is completely accessible on a Mac or a PC. Um, next stage, I think we have a very quick interlude around cloud spaces. And one of the um, core technologists that we work with, Tridib Chakravarte, who's the CEO of storage DNA, and also, if you have ever heard of the, the concept data dedupe, you know, the quantum is um, put out many years ago. He's one of the guys who wrote the, the actual patent and the code around making the technology work. So he's had a really robust experience in the industry. And why don't you come on up, TC, and talk a little bit about Avid Cloud Spaces, cloud workflows, and how things come together. I think you'll really enjoy this. Thank you, Mike.
<clears throat> why don't I get started while that's kind of pulling up? Um, so this NAB, uh, Avid announced Avid Cloud Spaces. Um, have all of you guys heard of it? Has anybody played with it yet? No, all right. So it's essentially uh, an onboarding technology from on-premise to cloud, uh, designed to make it easy to integrate getting to cloud directly from your Avid Nexus, right? And uh, one of the things that sort of became obvious as we, as we talked through NAB was the word cloud was getting thrown around a lot, right? So we, we, there was announcements around Avid Nexus in the cloud, and there's Avid Nexus cloud spaces, and then there's Avid Nexus, right? So there's a lot of confusion about how do all of these technologies work together and if they work together or not, right? So one of the things that we wanted to kind of highlight is how these different technologies work, what are the limitations, and how do you actually get them all sort of working together uh, in, in a way that, that, that makes sense for your workflows, right? So I'll keep talking. Uh, so if you, if you look at Avid uh, Nexus, it's, it's what you guys are used to using, right? You bring the physical storage in, it's got a file system that runs on it, and you get shared access to that storage with the various editor, uh, editors you've got deployed. May that be Avid or may that be Adobe, right? Now, what Avid's done is taken that file system and put it on a virtual server running in the cloud. And that virtual server now doesn't talk to physical storage, but now talks to Azure blob storage. I'm pretty sure it's Azure blob. I'm not sure if it's anything but Azure blob. Now you can spin up, it is Azure blob, yeah. So now you can spin up a virtual machine, a, a virtual Avid editing station in the cloud. It then talks to the Avid file system in the cloud, which then talks to Azure blob storage. Now that's Avid Nexus running in the cloud, which is kind of what's happening on premise, but just ported up into the cloud, right? Now, wow, great. Well, now I got visuals, so it'll be easier. So this sort of, uh, I'll just recap really quick, right? So this is where we have an on-premise, uh, let me start slideshow. Oh, doesn't like slideshow, all right. All right I'm just gonna talk through it without slideshow. Um, but this is what the on-premise looks like, right? You have your Avid file system sitting here, you got a regular workspace, your editors access, access that folder or workspace, it accesses the physical storage. In the cloud, pretty much the same thing's happening, right? Your cloud editors are accessing, once again, a regular workspace, goes to the file system, but now goes to blob storage. Now, what happens with cloud spaces is something completely different. Your on-premise Nexus file system exposes a workspace to you. For all practical purposes, when your editors see that workspace, it looks like a local workspace. But when you put data into it, it's traveling over the wire into the cloud, into the same Azure blob storage that sits up in the cloud. So any data you put into cloud space or try to access from cloud space, it's dialing home. So if you guys have you know, worked with FTP before, think of uh, Avid Cloud Space as a folder, which is virtualizing your data, setting up on an FTP server. That's, that's literally what's happening with Cloud Spaces, all right? So, you know, I want to start off by kind of dispelling some of this confusion around what's Avid Nexus in the cloud, what's Avid Nexus on-prem, and what's Avid Nexus Cloud Spaces, right? Now, there's an important point I want to make. Avid Nexus in the cloud writes to blob storage. Avid Cloud Space writes to blob storage. But this blob storage and this blob storage don't talk to each other today. So don't expect that if you put your data up into Azure blob through cloud spaces that you can access it through Avid Nexus in the cloud today. Now we've been told that this is gonna be addressed in the future at some point, but right now there are separate stores uh, operating completely independently of each other, all right? So 
if you now start looking at, all right, great, so what can we do with Avid Nexus Cloud Spaces? One of the things that you can do is gives you a very simple way to start backing up your projects, your workspaces, files, folders, straight into the cloud. You can use your desktop tools. You can drag assets from your on-premise uh, workspaces directly into cloud workspaces, and those files are getting uploaded for you directly into Azure Blob. Right? So it's a very easy way to get cloud storage and to put your data into the cloud. All right? Now, when things start to get interesting is once your data sits in a Nexus cloud space, it looks exactly the same as your data sitting on an on-premise workspace. But if you point Avid or Adobe directly at the Nexus cloud space, well, what's going to happen? It's going to start doing a round trip and start downloading files literally from the internet. Right? That's what it has to do. So if you decide to open up Avid, uh, Avid or Adobe from the cloud space, you're going to start seeing it hang, or you're going to start seeing files getting downloaded, which is going to take a while. So one of the things that you, know, you want to be careful of is not treat the cloud space volumes as another local workspace on your Nexus. It's vastly different. Right? So you want to make sure that um, you know, you're, you're not just opening up an application directly from the Nexus cloud space volumes. Uh, yes, obviously, speed and time is one thing. But what you've just done unknowingly is triggered off maybe a download of a terabyte of data. Right? And terabyte downloads are not free. Right? It's going gonna, it's gonna to cost you. You're going to get charged. The credit card you put on file is going to get charged. So you want to be careful that you don't want to just open up workspaces, point applications, and now you're getting charged for downloads and egress. Right? So whenever you think about cloud, you're paying for access, you're paying for downloads. There's a constant charge involved. Right? So once again, that's something else you want to be careful of. Um, the other option is, OK, I don't open any applications, but what if you want to access that one bin or that one sequence where the clips are now living in your Nexus cloud space. How do you bring back only those three clips? Well, it's kind of tough. What you may have to do is actually download your entire project back down into your local workspace and then access it. But now you're paying the penalty of doing a full project download. right? So one of the things that we've done is introduced our own data management layer that lives between your Avid Nexus on-premise workspaces and your Nexus uh, cloud workspaces and starts to give you uh, essentially a tool that lets you manage data between your on-premise and your cloud storage. Right? Since we're short on time, I'll skip some of these slides and I'll go right into you know, the one that highlights the workflow. So our product, which is DNA Fabric, lives as a virtual machine between your Nexus on-prem and your cloud spaces. So the first thing it does is that it connects to your Nexus, it discovers all your workspaces, which is great, and then allows you to start doing workflows. The first simple one is you can select a bunch of on-prem workspaces, select the target cloud space, and Fabric can automatically mirror your data from one workspace to the other, incrementally, automatically in the background. So think of it as giving you a you know, a time machine that goes from your on-prem to your cloud spaces. So you get instant cloud backup uh, through Fabric. One of the other things that we can do is not only give you backup to cloud spaces, but we can snapshot your data in cloud spaces. Essentially, so you're getting point in time, previous versions of your projects or your media files if you're making changes, right? Now, the next thing it also does is gives you the ability uh, to essentially start parking projects or sequences from on-prem workspaces to cloud spaces. So we support both Avid bins and projects. So you can point us to a bin or a project. We'll parse the bin, we'll parse the project, collect the media files, and then move only that selectively into cloud space. We support Adobe Premiere as well. Right? So it becomes a great tool to say, OK, my you know, project's done. I want to park it into the cloud. Uh, you can very easily just select the bin, the project, the finished product, and we'll only move those assets into cloud space for you, right? Now, the third one is actually sort of the most interesting one, which is our ability to let you selectively bring clips back from the cloud, 
right? So let's say you come back into your edit bay, you have a offline project, but you know you need this bin or this sequence back. Well, what you can do is you can tell Fabric, here's an ALE export of what I wanna bring back. Maybe one clip, maybe three, maybe a sequence. Fabric then identifies the media files associated with that clip sitting in cloud space and does a selective download back into your local workspace. And why is that so big? Because we are now minimizing on your egress costs, which is gonna be one of the highest costs if you are adopting any cloud storage, right? So giving you now the selective ability to bring back content is one of the key things that we're doing with Avid Cloud Spaces, right? So, you know, I wanted to keep our presentation short, uh, but, you know, to summarize, uh, Avid Nexus, Avid Nexus on-prem, Avid Nexus in the cloud, and Avid Nexus Cloud Spaces are all very different, distinct technologies. Uh, and right now, the data that you write in each one of them don't talk to one another. Now, this will probably be remedied in the future. Uh, do not, absolutely do not treat cloud spaces like a regular workspace, right? Don't assume you can open applications directly off of it. Uh, you know, don't assume you can just, you know, willy-nilly download data from it. You, you, you got to treat it with care because it's going to show up on your credit card, all right? Uh, and, and our product, Fabric, can help you bridge a lot of these workflows as you adopt cloud, all right? That's pretty much all I had. Any, any questions, guys? Cool? All right. Thank you so much. And from that, as we're getting set up with the panel to speak real quick, Matt, do we have a break or do we go straight on? We're going to go straight on through. So um, one of the things Storage DNA has is a decision calculator that can help you sort of understand between on-prem storage, cloud, the different versions of cloud from Glacier to active storage in the cloud, what it costs. Say if you want to put 100 terabytes, what's your cost on-prem? What's your cost on LTO? What's your cost on, cost on cloud? Because a lot of people are saying, hey, let's just put everything in the cloud. And what they did was they designed a, a web tool that you can just enter in your data, click the boxes of AWS, Google, Azure, Avid Nexus, other, other storage that's out there on the market, just click on it and say, how much will this cost me for three years? So it's a pretty interesting tool. Um, we're setting up, um, the panel discussion, which is always amazing. These, these three people have incredible production experience on some great shows, and I'll let them, am I doing the introduction, or Jeff will I'll be doing the, Jeff again. once we get Scott in, who is sick tonight, and he still showed up, so we're really appreciative about that. Um, so that concept's happening. We also had some other partners here. Um, Telestream is on one corner here, and they've created something really slick called CloudPort. And what that allows you to do is you can buy the lowest cost Telestream available and it can broker overflow jobs straight to the cloud. As well, you can actually literally do buy a job per basis, add functions within the Telestream product set of options that you may not want to buy, but if you have a job come up, it's able to integrate, take that, and then broker that back and forth, giving you really what the cloud is about expanding when you need additional performance, contracting and not paying for it when you don't. Um, in addition, we have another one of our partners, MOG, that has a very, very cool SDI and file-based ingest, allowing it to relationship between proxy, high res, a lot of productivity. Um, it's a company out of Portugal. I definitely would recommend you speaking to them. So without further ado, let's get into the reality of reality. Yes, sir. Howdy, everyone. I'm Jeff St. Pilar. I'm with Keycode. Um, with me is Scott Randall and Mark Redondas. Uh, we're going to have you each introduce yourselves, and uh, then we'll get off to some uh, Q&A about what's real in reality. Mark? Greetings, fellow post-production professionals. Uh, my name is Mark Redondas. I'm head of post-production at Buna Murray Productions. Um, if you don't know us, we do... We invented the reality genre with MTV's Real World back in 1992, and we do all reality all the time. Scott. Hi, I'm Scott Randall. I'm the VP of Technology and Workflow at MaxPost. Uh, MaxPost is um, about two blocks down the street. 
where uh, we provide post services to original productions. Um, that's sort of where we came from. Um, so we're also all reality all the time in that sense. We provide post services all to other free mental companies like 495. So we have followed in those footsteps with Jersey Shore and Floribama and shows like that. Um, originals, big shows, Deadliest Catch, uh, as you may know. Sounds good. And before I came to Key Code, I worked on little productions like American Idol, um, America's Got Talent, So You Think You Can Dance, Skin Wars. There's a whole bunch, a whole bunch of stuff I've been associated with that you forget as time goes on, but it's all reality TV. So let's let's kick it off. Uh, we'll kick this to Mark first, uh, Ben Scott. Um, unscripted or reality TV is the one place where you don't know the story or the rules of telling it before you begin. Uh, what are some of the challenges that resort from this type of storytelling? The thing about reality TV um, compared to scripted is what is the last thing you do when you're writing a script? Anybody? The end, right? And when we do reality TV, we do not know what the ending is. So we are starting the edit process before we know how it finished. And that is tremendously challenging as far as figuring out what the story is what to feature, how to construct, how to basically do we start from the beginning? You just don't know. So you're really flying blind for the beginning, first few episodes of most shows. And that is probably the most challenging thing for reality. Scott, what do you think? Yeah, absolutely. Um, part of that not knowing how it's going to be told leads to a lot of challenges, like tons and tons and tons of footage. Like you just never stop shooting because you never know if you have it in the can or not, you don't know if you've actually finished the story. Um, a show that we're doing right now, the network, it was pitched to the network a certain way, it's a reality show, they go out and they shoot it that way, the network starts seeing cuts and they're like, whoa, 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 what, what is this? And then of course everyone's like, well, this is what we talked about. And the network's like, nah, we don't want that anymore. So now we're going back out and reshooting. But remember, this is reality, so this, all the story that happened at this time we can't lose, we can't recreate, we just have to sort of do, pick up interviews and kind of hope that we can fix it to their, to their liking. But yeah, it's just, it never ends. They never know when they're done. A little bit of second unit there, I yeah. guess. Um, so you've both been part of this business um, quite a while now. Mm -hmm. uh, what technological changes have made this sort of work easier than it was, say, five to 10 years ago? Um, Scott, you wanna hit that one first? Sure, uh, probably um, automation, file-based media, those, the combination of those things. You know, we used to have racks and racks and racks of uh, media composers with tape decks and people manning them and tapes coming in and, and just, and that was the offline dig and then you have to go back and do the same thing for the up res and it had a ton of people and now it's basically down to one person can do all of that stuff. Um, with so a remote desktop. Yeah, <laughs> from somewhere else. <laughs> um, I, I take issue with the question which says, has made our life easier? That's true. Um, I would argue that it has not made our life easier, and it really traces all the way back to the invention of hard drives. When hard drives became basically free for all intents and purposes, uh, that opened up the floodgates for production to never hit the off button. And the, <laughs> it's true. And the amount of media that comes in on a daily basis for any one of our shows is just astronomical. So yes, it's easier for production to acquire anything and everything, but when it comes to post, we are really struggling to try to stay ahead of the media tsunami that's just overwhelming everything. And finding a needle in a proverbial haystack, it's not even just one haystack anymore, it's a whole <coughs> city full of haystacks. So, it's not been easier, it's actually a little bit harder. True, and the one thing I've run into on some of the competition shows, well, they'll be shooting a rehearsal, and the next day someone says, holy crap, what happened yesterday in rehearsal was great, do we have it on EBS? Let's pull it, and we need to cut it into the show at the last minute, mm -hmm. which is always exciting for everyone involved. But being the professional that you are, you recorded it and you know you have it on the show. <laughs> Luckily, luckily the, uh, the system had grabbed it for us, we so we, it, yeah. we didn't dump it. We didn't, we didn't get that far to burn it yet. Um, so, Mark, your, your team worked on Avid, yep. then they didn't well, work we, on we Avid? We started out working on three-quarter-inch videotape. Nice. 
Yes, R some, yes R I'm that old. RM450s. Uh, no, there was something called Strassner, Ooh. which was computer controlled, um, two single three quarter decks. Uh, and we spent something like nine weeks on one half hour show. And seven of those weeks were spent reconstructing the cut. Every time, every, so every you, you just answered that the technology's made your life easier. Yeah, that part of well, but yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> what so was, what was the question? So you were you were avid, then you weren't avid, yeah. and then you went back to avid. Yep. Um, what's Why? part of the way avid works that ah. keeps you coming back? Uh, a few things. Number one, um, their oh. Nexus shared storage product is bulletproof. We've had it spinning for literally years and really have not had a, had a, had a hiccup, um, so I'm very happy with that. Uh, number two is a shared workflow. Uh, how many people have 350 seats in their organization at one time? Yeah, uh, so you know, it's like we have a lot of people all playing in the same pool. And then finally, what Michael was showing is the user interface, um, trim mode, things like that. People really like that. It, works well for what they want to do. So storage, interface, and I forget what the other one was. Collaboration. 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 <laughs> Collaboration. Collaboration. Right. So um, since you mentioned the new interface, mm -hmm. what did you think? How do you think that's going I think to it's work? great. I, I want to pair it with a new cheese grater and go to town. <laughs> so, it's a, so it's a nice pairing, of, you know. And a nice uh, line. Nice. Um, Scott, in working with uh, locations that are far flung, somewhere out there like in Alaska. Yeah. Um, what influence does Post have on production that makes it run smoother for everyone? Well, we um, we actually have a lot of control over our productions be because of that. Um, so we have to, you know, we have to know what cameras they're using, what codecs they plan to shoot, what formats they plan to shoot in. We need to know every camera that's going out before it goes out, so we're ready for it when it comes back. Um, we need to know how they're going to manage their media, how they're going to run their storage, uh, what their plan is for backing up. So, you know, once the show gets sold, like, we're there first thing right away because that's when post starts, right? As soon as mm -hmm. they pull a card out of a camera, that's post. It's now post. And if they mess it up, copying cards, which people still do, I don't get it, but they still do it, uh, even with an automated program. Um, there's a problem later, and it's going to take time out of getting that footage into edit, and that's always the biggest um, the biggest chore. Rush yeah, is, you know, we need it immediately, and we need all of it. And I've had drive, drives shipped to me from productions that were in Alaska that were wrapped in the linens and the towels from the hotel because it's the only thing they had to pack it because they discovered the internet connectivity they hoped they'd had yep. really didn't exist anymore. No, not in, the, in a lot of our locations. You know, we get vendors that are like, "You should do this thing, or you should do that thing," and it's online, and it's like, "Nope, this is 56k dial-up." That's what we have in Dutch Harbor, Alaska. That's the best. Or we could do a, a 3G um, uh, sat phone. Yeah, uh, sat phone. But it's not. It doesn't work for the amount of footage that comes in. And the cost would be a little bit yeah high. Right. So then, what in terms of what's new in terms of technology that for deliveries on the back end that you've adapted your Avid workflow to help you meet, or other parts of your workflow to help you meet? Um, you know, for deliveries, so when we went all file-based and a lot of our deliveries went file-based, we were exporting files and out of Avid and, you know, you export it, there'd be a problem. And export it again, there'd be a problem. And then we heard about Cinedec and we looked at that, tested it, and that was great, especially for our workflow, which we have a kind of a unique, I don't know if you guys do this, but when we output a show, the, the producers get one shot at the mix and the color at the same time. They don't do separate reviews because they feel like they don't have enough time to do that. So we're outputting the show to a do you, file. Do you output, or are they watching in the color bay or the audio bay? The color bay. When the audio in there is, you know. <laughs> it's good. Pretty it's good. good. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but that, that we'll output that file, and then sometimes that's uploading that night because it airs the next day. Um, so we do it in a single pass. So being able to do that, a real-time output, have the file as soon as it's done, you know, and then with also their same, I'm like shilling for them, but um, Cinex Tool is the same product, same company, to be able to quickly insert a fix or add some audio tracks or pull some audio tracks off has been a great 
and not have oh, to QC us. the entire. And we know the same again. file. The essence is still the same. Nothing has changed. So, Mark, what? Um, does anyone know what um, WAN acceleration is? W A N wide area network, Signient, uh, Espera, things like that. Anybody familiar? Uh, those are the tools that have changed our life. Uh, you were mentioning when we stopped doing tape delivery, that dates to the Japanese tsunami that basically killed the videotape plant, in the one videotape plant in Japan that made HDCAM SR tapes, and overnight the network said, eh, we don't need tape anymore. We'll take a, uh, a file. And so we are now basically going right out of our online facility right to the network's delivery. Uh, and that happens courtesy of these wide area network accelerating programs. So here's a stock tip. If you uh, want to buy something that is going to grow leaps and bounds in the future, um, Signian is a private company at this point, uh, but Aspera is tied in with IBM, and that is a growth area that is going to be unbelievable um, because nobody's sending tapes anymore. It's all just click, click of a button. I've, I've actually been in the scenario where I've gone to send files, and it's you know just across Hollywood, and it would take you know they say oh, it would take three hours. And I have a videotape; I can be there in two minutes. Nope, not going to take it. Yeah. So they don't that, have a machine to play though. Yeah, they're they're a lot of things have changed. So um, some Apple announcements this week. Yeah. Um, how do you think this is going to affect how your team works creatively? Um, <laughs> they're really expensive, and therefore we probably won't buy a lot of them. But if, and we currently are not finishing in 4K, uh, but that could change depending on who buys the show. Um, and if that is the case, then it seems to me um, purpose built for that process. So that is going to open up the checkbooks. Uh, but just for an offline system, um, it's, you know, it's beautiful, but a little bit of overkill. Um, so I'm looking to it as a actually a cheap solution for a 4K finish. And if you look at the monitor that comes along with the cheese grater, um, that's a 6K monitor for like five grand. It's a 6K HDR monitor right. for right. six grand with the stand. Yeah, and that is you know a lot cheaper than 40 grand, which is about the standard right now. Yep. So that's actually a bargain. So what do you think, Scott? Yeah, I mean that's that's the same. Same for us. It's it'll take a lot of 4K shows to to open up the checkbooks to buy it, but I can see it on the finishing side. Um, probably not so much the offline side, um, but you know the the Resolve guys would love it. No, definitely, yeah. It'll it'll be able to do some interesting work there. Um, so Scott, um, if you could go back in time and tell earlier you a few tips to make this part of the business smoother for you. What would those be? Besides stay in school and don't go into this business? <laughs> <laughs> Besides that. <laughs> uh, no, I did finish school, but uh, <laughs> when I left college, I was working for a charter sailboat company, and I should have just stayed doing that and not come back to this. Uh, a little less stress. Yeah. In Alaska? No. <laughs> um, I think I was thinking about this, and other than being a little more assertive for me personally, um, when things are being talked about and planned and whatnot, uh, because you know you don't want to always stand up and say, you know what, I'm right, you're wrong, but it's told there's, you so. <laughs> yeah, there's so much headache on the back end if things aren't done correctly on the front end. And I used to do online and I did color and we would sit in there and the producers would be like, how can we fix this? And I would be, I, my pat response was, shoot it better. <laughs> so Fix it and pre. Yeah, it's, it, it starts way, way sooner. And for me in this business, you know, I was being too nice too, mo too much. Um, and now I'm just mean. So. <laughs> <laughs> nice. We're mean. Um, Mark, what does earlier you need to know? Uh, you know... I would sum it up this way, and this is less technological and more personal. Uh, don't worry, be happy. You know, it's, there's a lot of stuff that I used to stress about, and you know, you don't want to be the person that says, I told you so, you, you should have done that. Uh, people will figure it out. 
you know, and there's no point in trying to be, um, trying to get your way all the time. It's just don't worry about it, it'll work out. So that's kind of um, looking back on my career is, is one of the things that I would have focused on. The sun, the sun will rise tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah, so my ex-wife said, you're not curing cancer, you're just making TV shows. Right, and reality TV. Yeah, yeah and reality I, 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 I threw that line out there during a, a prep meeting for a show, and it was not well received. <laughs> I'm in the entertainment business. If everything goes horribly, someone's not going to be entertained. And people were, no, don't, don't, don't say that again, Jeff. All right, uh, any questions from our folks out in the audience? There's a microphone that's just arrived. Oh, not on. Number five? All right, well, anyway. Yeah, there you there go. There we go. What I We're, we're actually, this is, we're folks that produce content. We're not uh, manufacturers. Oh, okay. Manufacturers Sorry. are over there. Okay. That'd I'll be a question to ask that. them <laughs> after, after we're wrapped here. So I was wondering if you could elaborate, how do people incorrectly copy camera cards from your experience? That's a mystery. <laughs> how do they do it? I don't. Oh, they don't copy the whole card structure. So a lot of our automated transcode and ingest stuff is based on the, the full card structure as the camera records it. So the... Um, PPAP folders. Uh, now I'm not gonna, I'm spacing well, the name of the, the card. The classic problem is they shut off the camera before it's done, so the power goes off to the card and what he's talking about doesn't Files happen. Yeah. Uh, so the card is basically corrupt and you don't have all the information that's there. Tell us what happens then. You're screwed. You're screwed. <laughs> Or you'll get a helpful DP who thinks they're going to go in and cherry pick out just the good takes. And so you get a, a, a folder of three MXF files and that's it. And there's not the full structure of that card, you know. Um, in, the, in scripted, you would reshoot. In reality, it's already happened. So that's, that's part of the challenge there that you don't have the option to go, go back and, well, we don't have it. Let's, let's do the take again tomorrow. And this is not a rare occurrence. I have an email on my phone like from an hour ago where somebody's going, oh, well, we went back to the card and it's zero bytes and, and you know, it happens. Yep. More questions. You, sir. How many shows do you guys have going on? Um, depends on when you ask, but anywhere from three to ten different shows. We're most busy in the summer. Um, and I think right now there's about ten shows in post. Um, so what you're talking about is really a development process, um, and there's a long sort of um, scale between full show and just kind of a napkin sketch of an idea, and we've done everything from here's a full-on finished product to here's a rip -a that we of an idea that we might have, and, and it's usually somewhere in between that gets a show sold. Uh, but yeah, we do a lot of development stuff. Um, I wouldn't say for free, it's self-financed and the hopes that it'll go big. Uh, you mentioned Cynodec. Yep. And uh, have you uh, applied or tested Avid's ability to insert edit now? Or, and or if so, why choose Cynodec over the Avid's workflow for that? Um, yes, we have. We use Media Composer to output to Cynodec all the time. Um, in HD. Um, the nice thing about it is, is whether it's a ProRes file that you need or a DNX file that you need or whatever, it, you just make that file in Cynodec and Composer looks at that as a tape deck. It looks at it actually like a 5500 um, HDKMSR deck and just outputs. I mean, we, you know, we've been doing this for four years, five years, something like that. So right, before. So now that I added the ability to insert edit from files. Yeah. I have, have not experimented. Yeah. Well, 2018, I mean, they've had it for a while. I just, I have not employed it myself. Why, John? Because you never make a mistake? <laughs> no, I just re-record over them. 
what, one of the things about the Synodec workflow is if you are laying off baseband to a Synodec, you can actually be watching the watching it go down like you would with a videotape machine. Not according to the guy that made Synodec, I asked him about confidence head playback. Did he have not not stand? confidence head playback, but watching it as it goes down, QCing your own work. But you have playback to, to QC because you're watching it as it goes out, too, not coming back from. It. Correct, but if you're looking for you know booms in the wrong place and stuff you need to fix. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, that's scripted. Oh, yeah. That's the exception I took. Oh, yeah. Which the Ava probably does, too, but I'm just saying, given that they offered that feature, I was just curious. Right. Not yet, yeah. Not yet. You, sir, with the microphone. What kind of onboarding do you do for new people when you have 350 users on a shared storage system? Um, I'm not quite clear what you mean, onboarding of new users. Well, like when, when people are new to, new to working at your facility, do you spend time going over how things are organized, what, giving access, read, write, like things like that? Like how do you approach that kind of thinking? Very carefully. Um, <laughs> we, uh, ingest is done through something that we call the sponge, which is a centrally located, you know, just a few people are operating that. So it isn't like 300 people are all throwing random things in there. Um, so that's pretty controlled. Put out like the storage I, I mean, I'm, I'm struggling with how to answer the question other than the sense that um, people often come to BMP from an, at an entry level position and move up from there. So by the time they're actually working on um, shows, they've been at the company for a while and you know, they know where the bathroom is, they know where the kitchen is, they know sort of our corporate culture um, and then, and they also have an idea of like specific, specific shows and, and workflows. Um, so it's kind of a, a gradual process. We don't have just strangers coming in the door and just starting to. And, and if the if the the question is about how you take care of that technically on your shared storage and your systems, the the good thing about reality TV is typically the security requirements are not as stringent as other sorts <laughs> of uh, genres of work. So uh, a lot of times there'll be shared credentials used on shared storage and you know, a single set of credentials on an edit station because they haven't had to be hardened and most of the security is taking place at the physical access to the building level. Yeah, yeah we I guess I meant more in the sense of like, for example, if you're custom the way that you would have access to it, sure, you would want to protect that from being able to see. Yep. Like, Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, we're now global. Um, so on Thursday of next week, um, Facebook is launching um, MTV's The Real World in English in Atlanta, in Spanish in Mexico City, and in Thai in Bangkok, Thailand. Um, and two of those country shows are being done here in Glendale, and the third uh, is being done in Bangkok. So yes, they're sharing um, graphics, although I, I, the word sharing isn't quite accurate because they're all unique to each city, but yes. So we have a, a massive, um, avid nexus system that everybody who is working can all access. If that answers the question. We, we, do the same, we do the same thing for music because Original owns a music publishing company, so they're very keen to use same the same music over and over from their library and not use other libraries. Um, so, you know, music is shared across shows. It depends on the show, but, you know. So there, there was a question, how, how big is your Nexus? Or in multiple, how big is your Nexi? Uh, how big is yours? Our Nexus, <laughs> <laughs> our Nexus is 800 terabytes. Our ISIS 7000 is 320 terabytes, and so is our ISIS 5500. Um, like around multiple petabytes. I'll put it that way. Big. A lot of stuff. We just buy it big in the beginning and fill it up. <laughs> but the answer is yes. You can you can ex extend. Yeah. yeah. Gentleman with a microphone in the back. Uh, yeah. Um, I'm wondering, like, what can DP, DPs do to make your life easier in post production? Say, say again. Um, what can DPs do to make your life easier in post production? Oh. Hmm. Uh. <laughs> um, 
I guess it depends on the show, but don't, you know, you don't need to roll 24-7. <clears throat> it's okay to stop rolling. Um, yeah, just don't stop and start. Like, if you're going to stop and start, just roll. But if, you know, it's okay to stop. Um, and then if we talk about something at the beginning, you know, if we say, hey, we're shooting this in log or we're shooting this in Rec. 709, make sure that all your cameras, you know, if you're in charge of the shoot, that all the cameras are set up the same way, everyone's got the same time code coming in, you know, this guy's not shooting 30 non drop and this guy's shooting 2398, and, you know, just consistency, because all of that stuff leads to slowing down ingest when it finally gets back and people are clamoring for it at, at that point for edit. Um, I would add to that, which those, those are all great ideas, but if you want to be adventurous in your technological um, experimenting, have a reason for it. Um, just because they make 8K cameras doesn't mean that it's the right tool for any particular project. And a lot of DPs, um, I have a tremendous amount of respect for them and what they do. Um, I thought it was going to be one early on. Uh, and then they said, ah. anyway. Um, but 8K is a great tool if it's appropriate. Just because you can do it doesn't mean you should. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, okay. Um, seeing the fact that I'm relatively new to uh, videography in itself and I've started doing vlogging and whatnot and you guys like talk about reality shows, like how do you decipher like the footage that you're going to grab a hold of and know exactly which direction you want to go towards the theme of the show? Um, those are called story producers. Um, usually they're on set taking story notes um, live in real time. Um, and so they give an outline of what's going on to the um, senior producers and then they decide what beats of a story they're going to follow and then how they're going to tie all those stories together. Deadliest Catch has a very um, complicated yet rigorous because they're all out on boats, right? So they, every night they sat phone back to Dutch Harbor and each story producer on the boat, there are two people on each boat, they tell them what happened that day and they write that down and then when they get all those notes back eventually, but this allows them to say, look, you know, on the Northwestern, Sig was having a hard time, let's see if any of the other captains are having a hard time with X. And then you can sort of tie it together later and you have a story beat that relates across the whole fleet. And Do you ever find that that are doing that? Never. That never happens, <laughs> ever. <laughs> so it's, a col it's almost like a collaborative writer's room with what you've already got. You might have to ask someone to say something again um, if you missed it. Um, but it's kind of, the networks are pretty strict about if you'd reenact something they want you to say, it's like say, Identify. this is reenacted, um, not, was not real at the time. Yeah. Unfortunately, um, reality TV has a bad rap that everyone thinks it's fake. And I will look you in the eye and tell you, um, on a show like The Real World, absolutely not. Everything that is there is what actually happened, and we never go back. Which season did you do? Partial to San Francisco, because that was the first season that I started working on. Is that the one with Yeah. I know that one. Yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm that old. <laughs> hey, Hey guys, so we're gonna have one more question, but before we go to it, I just wanted to note that uh, manufacturers are gonna be available for the next 45 minutes um, to give demonstrations of their products, and then we're also gonna have the conference room where you can get hands-on with the meeting composer. So uh, with that, is there one last question someone wants to ask? Okay, I'll bring it over to you. So what's your normal size for uh, the editor team for like a regular show? What, um, pardon me? Editorial team size. Yeah, the, uh, and uh, oh. how they divide their... Uh, it varies. Um, it depends a lot on the budget of the show. It depends a lot on the timing, um, how many weeks they have in edit. Uh, it can be anywhere from four to probably 15 editors. Um, you know, it depends on the schedule, where they can leapfrog editors on episodes, um, how many weeks they have to, to delivery. 
and whether or not they know what the story is yet, that's another problem. We're probably, again, it depends. There's no one show, there's no one size fits all. Um, anywhere from a few to, you know, 35. Um, it just depends. And it really is time dependent. Awesome. So, fantastic. I'd like to really thank our panel for sharing your knowledge and experience with this crowd tonight. It's amazing. Use us as a resource. I think there's still um, some beverages outside. As we said, there's media composers inside. And um, we'll be open until 9 o'clock tonight. So thank you for coming. Thanks, everyone. <clears throat>